church when this is where we ought to feel honored to be able to lift our hands. I want us to lift our hands, and I want us just to give God thanks for his awesome presence that is amongst his people right now. Lord, you are here. You are here right now, God, and you are touching lives, and you are giving hope and strength. You're reviving the weary and encouraging the discouraged today. You are healing our bodies. You are touching our minds. You are here today, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God one more praise before we seat it? take a moment and dismiss all of our children uh, that will be going to our, our kids life a life kids service upstairs uh, even if you're a visitor uh, we want to encourage your kids to go be a part of it it's something special you'll have fun or Connor is that a word you'll have more fun up there than you will in here although one doesn't want to leave I get it just loves his pastor I get it wow I tell you there is there's an off awesome atmosphere in this room this morning, right? You can feel it. You can sense his presence and his glory in the room, and it's real. It's since it's genuine, and so we thank God for that. Hey, before I get into the word of the Lord, I want to, uh, man, anytime we have guests to come in, it's always good, but I don't think anybody has a further drive home than these folks right here. Uh, Bishop Eugene and Esther and Elena DePew, you guys stand. I want to honor them. They are the international... They are the national overseers for the Church of God for New Zealand. How about that? They are, I got to meet them, it was actually interesting, I think it's been about four or six years ago. It was during the assembly time. Uh, they were in this region. They actually have family that live in Naples. And the General Assembly was taking place in Orlando. And they had come down a couple weeks before we had our international General Assembly with our denomination, the Church of God. And they came on a Sunday morning, and after the service, they introduced themselves to me, and um, uh, we got connected with them. That next day, I took Eugene fishing, and we had a fan. They, they caught fish, and I showed them how to cook fish southern style, some fried, some fried snapper. And uh, it was just, I'm getting a little ring there, Barry, if you can just pull that back just a hair. Um, and, uh, and we just stayed in touch, and... Uh, all of the times that I've tried to, I've made trips to the Philippines, I've wanted to try to, since I'm on that side of the planet, or the earth, get over there and see them there in New Zealand. Um, I have a, an aunt and uncle who were missionaries in uh, Australia, Campbelltown, Australia. And when I told them that I became, I got connected and, and partnered with uh, uh, the DePews, and he, they, they said, oh, you are not gonna meet a kinder group. And then when I was in the Philippines, Dr. Mark Morris, who's the overseer there, he asked me, we were there the, the last time, and he said, hey, he said, have you had a chance to meet the Depews? And I said, actually, I did. I said, he said, well, I thought I saw you guys said something on Facebook. And he said, are they not some of the most genuine, some of the best people in the Church of God? And so uh, I have found that to be true. Tuesday, I was in Tampa for a meeting on one of the committees I was at, that one of the committees that I'm on for the state. And two of the members of that uh, committee uh, are from a church up in, in the middle of the state, up in Winter Haven. And uh, they were talking about guests they had at their church last Sunday. And he said it was the Depews. I said, oh, my gosh, I know them. I said, and they said, are, are they not some of the best people? So they've got this reputation. They've got this reputation of when people meet them, everybody says, are they not some of the best people in the world? And so we welcome you guys. I honor you guys, the work that you guys are doing there in New Zealand. Uh, again, we've stayed connected. Uh, thank God for social media when it comes to being able to connect with people halfway, literally halfway around the world. They are so far on the other side of the planet that if you go, if you go to New Zealand and you go a mile further, you're actually now closer than you were further. That might get that some of that might mess up your minds, but think about that. That's just how opposite they are of where we are on this planet. But, um, boy, the work that they're doing there and the hunger of the people, and I love watching the videos that they post of their services, their ministries, the updates of what God is doing there in the country of New Zealand, the nation there. And you guys are choice leaders, and I, I, I honor you, and I thank you. Thank you for the friendship and uh, the ministry partnership that we get to share in building the kingdom of God. Amen. Well, are you ready for the word of the Lord this morning? I'm doing something extremely different this morning. Um, 
I mean extremely different. This is so uncharacteristic of me. Um, and I've got my notes and I've got my PowerPoint and we're just going to see where this goes. But um, I have wrestled with this basically since July the 9th. Uh, and that's significant and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, I really wrestled with it this specific Sunday morning when the Lord said, this is the Sunday that I want you to talk about this and share this because I knew that we were going to have a ton of families gone this Sunday. This is the kind of message or revelation or what I share from my heart. It's kind of one of those that you want everybody to be there. So I'm hoping those that are not here this morning, I know we've got several that are, this is the last week before kids start school and so many of them are on vacation. I hope they're watching now or they will go back and watch this because I think this is very important. Um, I want to start with something that happened to me. And those of you, let me just say for those of you that are guests, you don't know me. And you don't know as far as how I feel about talking about prophecy and revelation and especially dreams. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not against those things. Believe me, you know that. Those that know that's, that you know who I am, you know that I am a strong proponent of those things. But I'm not one of these at the moment that I get a prophecy or I have a dream that I automatically just make the assumption that it's something that God has given me and that I'm supposed to share with everybody else. I take the time to let it work in me because I've had dreams sometimes that I, they were just so phenomenal. I thought, well, these have to be from God and only to find out that it was just, just a cool dream. And it was just something the Lord showed me or it's something that not said the Lord showed me, but just something that my mind just put together. Um, but we were, we were away July, uh, the first week of July, as you'll remember, we were uh, up in Ohio with our family. Let me just preface, I did not eat pizza the night before or anything that some sometimes, you know, make our minds go to a very creative or different place. Um, I woke up at 3.18 in the morning. And the reason that I'm telling you that is because the moment I woke up from this dream, I knew something was about this dream. It was beyond my ability to have, it's beyond my creative side, it's beyond my comprehension. And I immediately started writing down what I dreamt and what I felt like the Lord showed me. And so I'm going to take a moment and share you with you. And for those of you, some of you have already heard some of this in the Friday night prayer group that we had two weeks ago that I led this because I've only shared this with just a handful of individuals because I really wanted to weigh it out and see where the Lord was uh, going with all of this. So let me tell you what happened in the dream. In the dream, I dreamt that um, all of a sudden, all over the world, globally. This wasn't isolated just to one place. At first, I thought it was. I thought it was just to the particular area that I was in here in Naples. But all of a sudden, there started to be some flooding that was taking place over the earth. Um, and every day, the waters kept getting higher and higher and higher. And each day, it was creating more panic and it was creating more chaos um, city sewer drains were getting clogged up and uh, the streets were getting out of uh, the ability to, for people to drive. Um, the irony of all of this, and this is the part of the dream that really just really shook me up. The irony of all of this was that there was no rain. There was no rain coming down. And so the chaos that was taking place in people in the earth was trying to figure out why is the earth flooding and there is no rain? Where's this water coming from? This was, this was the thing. It, nothing like this had ever happened before. We've heard about volcanic eruptions, but, but literally the water, as though it was coming from inside rather than above us. And it was just literally climbing higher and higher and higher. Each day this was going on and the whole globe, was in chaos because it was a phenomenon that no one could explain and it was a phenomenon that no one could understand. We couldn't control it. As much as they were trying to relieve some of the flooding and clear up some of the drains and help with this, but it could not stop. And because this was happening every single day in increments going higher and higher and higher, there was a panic each day that was getting higher and higher. Now, one of the things that I noticed in the dream was that there were... Two responses 
in this. The unbeliever and the uneducated in the scripture, and notice I just put those in the same category, they were the ones that were panicking. But for some reason, believers, Christians, who had a real touch of the Holy Spirit in their life, for some reason there was a calmness and not only a calmness, but there was this unusual anticipation that something was happening, that this was, a sig- this was a signal of something that was getting ready to happen. And so each day, the more that this was happening, it's like the unbeliever and the uneducated in the Scripture was going greater in panic, and then the believer and those that were walking in tune with the Holy Spirit. We didn't understand it, but yet there was an incredible peace There was this enormous calmness and an anticipation something good was coming from all of this. And so as I observed all of this and I felt all of this, then the moment I woke up from my dream, I was not in panic. I had the sweetest peace I can't even describe. And that was another indication to me that this was not just some weird dream. And I I do believe I have a creative mind in some ways, but this was beyond anything that I've ever heard, seen, done, or understood. And so, but I couldn't get over the peace that I had. I could not tell you. And for those of you that you're, you're new to this church, you will know that this pastor has probably maybe one or two other times ever stood in this pulpit and talked about a dream that I've had. Maybe never. I'm not even sure. I can't remember. This is the, probably the first. I had such an incredible calmness and peace in all of this. And then I asked the Lord while I was laying there at 318 in the morning, I said, Lord, is this of you? What does this mean? And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go read Ezekiel 47. Now, I'm very familiar with Ezekiel 47. I've preached from it, and I'm getting ready to go to that reference in just a moment. But I was familiar with it, and I thought, oh, that's right. This has a lot of similarity to Ezekiel 47. Now, let me pause here and just tell you something about that. And don't get ahead of me because I know some of you are are like, okay, what is Ezekiel 47? We're going to read it together in a minute. So stay with me. But I had not heard a sermon from Ezekiel 47. I had not read a devotion. Nothing has triggered up to that point. There was nothing. It's not like I had, I heard a sermon about it and it caused me to have the dream or I read something in Ezekiel 47 and and it caused the dream or, or I had a conversation with someone about this. There was nothing remotely close to anything happening in my mind, heart, spirit, or my life that was taking place that predicated this dream and this, this revelation that I believe that I was receiving from the Lord. And then, and this was this is the part here. I know that some of you are going to think, okay, now you're crossing the line and getting into some weirdness, okay? And to be honest with you, I'm still trying to understand this part because this is a part that this has never ever happened to me, and I still don't know where this fits in. But then I heard the Lord say to me while I was laying there in that moment, I heard the Lord say, Sunday, May the twenty eighth, two thousand twenty three. Now, that floored me because anybody who knows me knows that I get real leery when anyone says that God said anything to do with a date. I'm just being honest. If somebody says, oh, the Lord's going to come back October 25th, 2022 or whatever, I'm like, okay, if, that, if God said that, if the Lord really said that, that means that he's not coming back any time between now and then. And, and, or if anybody throws dates out of future things of God. So I don't even know the reason for that date. I don't understand it, but he didn't say May the 28th. He said Sunday, May the 28th, 2023. Now, I'm laying there, and I want to tell you something. I've got a lot of stuff on my calendar, but I cannot tell you in 2023 what day a specific date falls on. I don't know what day New Year's is of 2023. Uh, you could tell me any day. You could say July the 4th, uh, December 25th. I don't know what specific day of the week that it falls on. So when he said Sunday, May the 28th, then I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to see if this is the Lord because how will I even know that Sunday is May the 28th? So I grabbed my phone, went to the calendar. Now I realize I got a one in seven chance of getting this right. That it, the coincidence of it falling on Sunday. And when I looked, it said Sunday, May the 28th. Now, to, even to this point, I don't know the significance of this. 
I don't realize what this is about. I do realize that that's about nine months from when I had the dream in July to that date. I don't know if that had anything to do. But you know me, I'm trying to run the numbers and crunch all of this and figure all this out and think, okay, what's going on? And, and the dream itself, I'm still trying to figure out what's all that about. And I get an idea from Ezekiel 47 here in a second. But then the Sunday, May the 28th, because, you know, is that the rapture? Is that something after the rapture? I, I just don't know. I can't put it together. So I shared it with the prayer team two Fridays ago, and I get home, and, and a week ago Sunday, I'm sitting in my house, and, and it's Sunday evening, and I'm looking over my notes of this dream because it has not left me, and it's transformed me, to be quite honest with you. And I thought, what is with, what is with Sunday, May the 28th, 2023? And so I started typing in the date, trying to find out, is that a significant date? And actually, whether this is tied to this or not, but it is interesting, that is actually Pentecost Sunday in 2023. Now, I didn't know that. I just know Pentecost Sunday is always the 50th day after, you know, that, that marks the resurrection of Christ. That's, the, that's kind of what they call Pentecost Sunday because that represents the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2. So I don't know if that has anything to do with that. I just, that was just another thing that made me go, wow, this is interesting. So in all of this... Here's one of the things that I got to tell you why I know this is something that is, I believe is from God. Because there's two things it's left me. And I'm not sure one of these is a good thing. One of them is, I can't tell you how much peace I have felt since then. Even when there's something that's chaotic going on, or if there's something that's coming against me, normally when I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm nervous about this, or oh my goodness, what's this going to do? What's this going to turn out? What's going to happen with this person? How are they going to receive this? I've had such an amazing peace. The second thing is, and I was telling uh, Paul and Mary Bellafado, we took them to the airport last Monday for them to be out of town, and I was telling them about it. And I said, Mary, this is the other thing I'm not so sure I might have to come and see you about. I said, but I've got this, I don't care attitude anymore. I don't care about, it's like, well, who cares? I don't, not, not a neglect, not in a, not in a non-compassionate way, but it's just like a, you know, let me, let me say it the way I told it to her. I don't give a rip attitude. I don't care. Uh, not a hardness, not a coldness, but just a, I, it, I can't explain it. I just can't explain it. So let's go back to this for a moment. What is Ezekiel 47? What is this whole passage of scripture about? And let me just kind of lay a quick foundation for you of this. The prophet Ezekiel is one of the, the prophets of the Old Testament. And... Ezekiel, as a prophet, he is living in a day that they are in exile. You know the story how God provided the promised land for the people of God. And they lived there. And, you know, God made a covenant with them. And he said, look, if you follow my covenant, you'll be blessed. My presence will always be with you. You'll win your battles. You'll, 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 have, the, you'll have the recipient of this covenant. But the moment you begin to worship other gods or you, you forsake me, then you're going to start having the world from the outside coming in and taking over. And that's exactly what happened. Happened more than once. But this particular time was probably the most dangerous time because the Babylonians came in. The children of God, those in Jerusalem, Israel, they were living unfaithful to the Lord. And so the Lord allowed what he said would happen if they forsook the covenant and left God. The Babylonians came in and they destroyed the city. They destroyed the temple. And that was very big to the people of God back then. The temple's completely gone. And so these people just moved into different regions outside of Jerusalem, mostly hiding in villages and hiding in, in mountains and caves and moving into other regions. Some of them just go into Babylon and they just become Babylonians and, and they start worshiping the god Babel instead of Baal, instead of God, and they just convert over into that religion. And Ezekiel is one of these that's kind of, he's still, he's still a prophet of the Lord, but yet the whole city, their home city's laying in ruin. Uh, there's no temple. And there's no hope. And God gives a prophet uh, a vision of things to come. And so in chapters 40 through chapter 48, the remaining eight chapters of Ezekiel, the Lord, through an angel of the Lord, gives a vision and a revelation to Ezekiel about a new city and a new temple and what God was going to do. 
And so it begins to bring hope to Ezekiel's heart as to what's going to come to pass. But now Ezekiel never lived in that time. Ezekiel was not familiar with the promised land. He grew up in this time of exile. And so he only knew of the stories. He didn't, he didn't grow up in it. He only knew about what was going on and what used to happen. But it grieved his heart because they lost the presence of God and they lost the Holy Land. And so the Lord says to Ezekiel, I'm going to give you a vision. And I'm going to show you that I'm going to restore it all. And I'm going to restore the temple. And in Ezekiel 47 is where we see what the Lord, the angel, who takes Ezekiel in this vision and shows him what's going on in the new tabernacle. This is where we pick up. Let me read these verses. Now he brought me, talking about the angel of the Lord, took Ezekiel back to the entrance of the temple. And here's what he said. I saw water pouring out from under the temple porch to the east. Now that happens to be where the altar was. That's very significant. And the temple was facing the east. The water poured from the south side of the temple, south of the altar. Then he took me out through the north gate and led me around the outside of the gate complex on the east. The water was gushing from under the south front of the temple. He walked to the east with me, and the angel, and he, measured, he had a measuring tape and measured off 1,500 feet, leading me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off another 1,500 feet, leading me through the water that was now knee-deep. He measured off another 1,500 feet of water, leading me through the water that's now waist-deep. He measured off another 1,500 feet. By now, it was a river over my head, water uh, to swim in, water no one could possibly walk through. And then he said, verse 6, Son of man, have a good look at this. So in the King James, do you see this? Then he took me back to the river bank while sitting on the bank I noticed a lot of trees on both sides of the river. He told me, this water flows east, descending to Araba, and then into the sea, the sea of stagnant waters. That's the Dead Sea. That's the Dead Sea. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. When it empties into those waters, the sea will become fresh. Wherever the river flows, life will flourish. Great schools of fish, because the river is turning the salt sea into fresh water. Where the river flows, life abounds. Fishermen stand shoulder to shoulder along the shore from Engadai all the way to Enelglium, casting their nets. The sea will teem with fish of all kinds, like the fish of the great Mediterranean. But the swamps and the marshes won't become fresh. They'll stay salty. But the river itself on both banks will grow fruit of all kinds. Their leaves won't wither. Their fruit won't fail. Every month they will bear fresh fruit because the river from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will be for good, or for, be for food, and their leaves for healing. So, pro, so Ezekiel gets this amazing prophecy. And this angel is taking him. And let me kind of walk you through this story to help you put some of this together. Here the angel grabs Ezekiel by the hand and he takes him to this new temple that's not even built yet. The temple was the place that represented the house of the Lord, the house of God. And he takes them there. And in the King James, I think it is the King James, it talks about a trickle of water. There's different descriptions of the, 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 the flow of water that's coming out of there. But it wasn't a lot of water. And so they're standing there and he notices that this trickle is creating like a little bit of a, I don't even want to call it a river. It's just kind of a little path, a stream. And so there's not much water coming underneath the altar of the porch of the altar, coming underneath. So he takes me, he says, I want you to walk with me. And so he takes him a thousand cubic, 1,500 feet. He measures it off. And then he says, now I want you to stand in there. And he says that the water is now ankle deep. So then he takes him and he measures off another 1,500 feet. and And he says, now stand in the water. And now the water is knee deep. And he takes him another 1,500 feet. And he says, stand in the water. And now the water is to his waist. And he says, now go another 1,500 feet. And he takes him and he gets him in the water. And the water's so high, he can't even touch the ground. And so you got to swim in it. And not only is it deep, but now it's wide. Now, think with me for just a moment. Because this is complete logic that is reversed of what we often think of when we see a river, a tributary or something. Typically, it starts wherever the main source is. It starts wide. If you ever look at maps and you just look at uh, lakes that are creating tributaries and little rivers and streams, they all start wide. And as they go, they get smaller and smaller till eventually it just kind of trickles out and there's no more flow. Okay? This is completely backwards. 
The source is showing a very small amount of water. And the farther you go, rather than it getting less and smaller and going away, it's getting deeper and wider. And so this in itself is a phenomenon that Ezekiel is trying to package in his mind to understand what is going on here. I mean, this doesn't, this is, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense in any form at all. How in the world can a little bit of water eventually turn into a river so wide that you can't even swim across it and it's so deep you can't stand in it? This has captured Ezekiel's heart and mind beyond anything that he could ever understand or see. And then the water arrives at a place into what's called the Dead Sea. Now, I've talked about the Dead Sea, but for those of you who don't know, let me give you a little background about the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is, I mean, it's, it's called the Dead Sea because all the water that flows into the Dead Sea, and there are three sources of contrib- tributaries that flow into the Dead Sea. But the water is so filled with minerals and salt. In fact, it's about 35% salt content. It is so high in the salt that, that anything that flows into it that has life dies immediately because it doesn't have, doesn't have the ability to produce the oxygen or anything at all. Not only that, it's, it's still today an amazing phenomenon. People will travel over to the Holy Lands and they want to go there uh, because you can't, you can't drown in it. You, 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 all you can do is float. It's that much salt content that you can't even, it's just, if you go and you just lay flat, whether you can swim or not, you don't have to worry. It's the safest place because you can't drown. You can't sink because there's that much salt content in it. Scholars believe that there are over 300 million gallons of water that flow into the Dead Sea every day. Yet the sea level never rises. It stays the same. And the reason being is because the salt content is so high that it evaporates as quick as it comes in. Now, one of the reasons, and I've preached this before, but one of the reasons that a lot of people, archaeologists, believe that the Dead Sea is dead is because it's not because it doesn't have a source of life coming in. It has no water going out. And the reason it has no water going out is because the Dead Sea sits 1,400 feet below sea level. That, my friend, is the lowest place on the point of the earth. Did you know that? The Dead Sea is the lowest place Physical place that you can step your feet on the point of the earth. It is 1,400 feet below sea level. And yet, it's quite close to the, the ocean. It's quite close to the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. It's close to seas, but yet, if there's these mountains. If you ever look at a geographical map, you'll see, you'll see the Red Sea over here. And then you'll see this mountain of terrain. And laying in this valley is this Dead Sea. And of course, if you've ever heard any of the teaching and the wondering where Sodom and Gomorrah is, there's a lot of, of scholars who believe that Sodom and Gomorrah, that, that city is buried underneath there when God brought the destruction of this. And that, that's a whole other sermon in itself. But I am so just fixated on this. And so to know that this is the content of this water... And he is saying that when this fresh water flows into this Dead Sea, it makes the water fresh. Now, let me give you a visual illustration this morning in your mind. If I had a table up here, and I had a bowl in the middle, and I had two glasses, and one side has a glass that, let's say it's 20 ounces, and it's fresh water. And on the other side of the bowl, I have another glass that's 20 ounces of salt water. If I take that salt water and I pour it into that bowl, and I take the fresh water and I pour it into that bowl, is that water fresh or salt? It's salty. Well, you guys passed your third grade uh, (laughs) test on this part of science, okay? Oh, sure. It may not be as salty, but it's still salt water. You're still not going to want to drink it. So the whole idea of this fresh water coming in and touching this mass sea of salt water and immediately making it fresh. And then he gives this description of all the life and all the fish and how now along the banks the trees become fruitful trees and they produce massive fruit that every month they're yielding fruit and its leaves are producing the oil for the healings. All of this is taking place. Then you've got to recognize that this is a, an interesting phenomenon that Ezekiel is getting. 
Now you're probably wondering, okay, where does this fit into prophecy? That, if that's a true prophecy, which it obviously is because it's in Scripture, then what does that represent? Does that represent something that's going to happen in our time? Does that represent, well, it is believed that that specific prophecy speaks about what's going to happen during the millennial reign, which we're going to be raptured before then and come back here for the millennial reign. So, so that speaks of a time of something that's probably not going to happen in our lifetime prior to the return of the Lord. However, this whole idea of that you now capture this understanding that there is a river of God that is able to flow out to the altar of the Lord and bring life and transformation everywhere it goes. That's the part of this prophecy that really should get the heart of the church stirred up and excited about this. This is the part that ought to to make us think, wow, what's going on here? Now, there's three things, just three symbols. Let me just show you what these are in here, okay? Because if you look at this and you study, you're going to see three things. You're going to see Christ. You're going to see the church. And you're going to see the Holy Spirit in these. Because when you look at Christ, you're going to see two things. You're going to see the source. You're going to see the source of, of all of this has taken place. That's the symbol of this in the Old Testament. This is Christ. He is the source of this. And he's only the source, but he's also the path by which this river just continues to flow. That's a representation of him. The Bible tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the source in all of this. He's the path in this. We see Christ in this this prophecy. But we also see the church because that represents the tabernacle. Paul tells us that we are the tabernacle of the Lord, that the church and the, the, the believer, we are the tabernacle. We represent the, the holy tabernacle. In the Old Testament, they had a physical structure. We have a physical structure too, but yet we know that when we leave here, the real tabernacle is not this building made by hands, but it is you and I who was made and created and formed by the Holy Spirit that now houses and that now tabernacles at the presence of the Lord. That's us. We come here to stir each other's gifts up and to to fuel the fire and to get our rivers flowing in us. So when we walk out here, we become the the church. We become the living tabernacle of the Lord. We take the presence of God into the earth and into those people around us. And then you see the Holy Spirit, which is the river. He's that stream. He's that source. He's that flow that we know that brings life, that that moves into places and and gets into the places that are dead, and he brings this transformed life. I believe this is a representation for us because I think it speaks of what's going to come. So I asked the Lord, I said, okay, help me marry the dream and this passage. What are you wanting Randy Holman to hear from this? And this was, a, this, was a, this was a tough part. This was almost a potter's wheel moment where the Lord just kind of pretty much had to set me down and take my mind off of everything that I've heard and seen and the way that I've understood everything and just allowed the Holy Spirit to kind of create a new, fresh understanding and a revelation of both the dream and this. And so there's a couple of things that He spoke to me. I am concerned as it relates to the condition, I can only say the condition of the church in in the United States. Uh, Bishop, you might say, oh, it's the same way in New Zealand. I don't know. But, But I'm concerned that in the American church, and let me just go ahead and classify it to what I feel like I can relate to more, the Pentecostal church, the Pentecostal charismatic church. I'm afraid that we've got into this mindset that we are just waiting for the Lord to return, that it's just going to get hard and we just got to be steadfast and immovable and eventually God's going to get us out of all of this mess. That we've kind of got the idea that the glory days are over, that the world is too consumed with the evil and the culture of compromise and the Babylonian spirit so to speak, that the church is just kind of, well, you can't change the world anymore. Nobody wants to hear the gospel. So what we're going to do is we're just going to encourage one another and we're going to try to just keep each other lifted and not fall prey to all the hardships because we know we got to go through it too. God, we're not, we're not, uh, we're, we're not imperative to, to any of these things that God is going to allow to happen. So, so we're going to have to go through these things, but we're just going to hold on 
and tie a rope and hang on and God will eventually rescue us and take us all out of here when the rapture. And boy, we just can't wait to happen for that. So that's kind of the, it's an escape mentality. Just when I, we just, we're going to sit here and just wait for God because, because God's mad and he wants to pour out judgment and wrath. And in fact, in some Christians, they're mad too. And they're wanting that. And we've lost our compassion to pray for people that abound in sin and their minds are screwed up. I just said that. Their minds are messed up and so they don't understand why they're struggling with their identities in Christ. They don't understand why they're struggling with their identities in their physical body. They don't understand why they can't break away from the things that you and I are scratching your head and say, why do you keep putting that over your life? Why do you keep putting that in your body? Because they're bound and they don't even know. And we've lost our compassion for that because we are now upset because they are making a mockery of God and we're like Jonah. Lord, don't bring revival. Bring judgment. Come down on them and punish them because they're talking about our God. And the problem with that idea and that spirit is we just want God to just wipe out all these heathens and wipe out all these rebels and wipe out all these blasphemers and get rid of them because they're making our lives as Christians uncomfortable and we're having to suffer because of their wickedness. That might be your child or your grandchild that you're talking about God bringing judgment and condemning. And we've lost that. We've lost that spirit to have compassion for the lost and we would rather hurry up and God speed it all up so we can get out of here rather than reaching down and helping somebody get saved before he comes. Because listen, if he comes right now, there's going to be a lot of people that are meant to go to heaven, but they're going to end up in hell. Are you hearing this preacher this morning? I'm telling you, I feel it stirred in my spirit already this morning. Which brings me to the first thing the Lord showed me. Number one is this. We need God to restore our faith in His promise to move by His Spirit again in these final days. We need to, we need to get restored in this mindset. The prophecy that there is still a great awakening and move of God yet to come. And we ought to be fostering and we ought to be planting seed and we ought to be stirring up the expectation that God is going to move in the earth and bring a great revival and there's a great freedom that's going to come and the Holy Spirit like that river is going to move into the most deadest places, the places that it just is impossible for anything that we can do to bring life. And he says, no, I'm going to bring a river in. My spirit is able to bring life to even the deadest places, the deadest of the deadest of places. The most bound, the most person who is more in evil than you could ever imagine. The Holy Spirit is capable of bringing power and deliverance and freedom. We need God to restore our faith in His promise that He's going to move by His Spirit again in the latter days. And He promised that. You know what happens? If you sit in that position of you're just ready to get out of here, you want God to just get all these wicked people. You know, they deserve that. They deserve that. I get it. But let me tell you something. If you and I got what we deserved, we'd all be surprised too. We need, we need to get back to that place where we... Because listen, if you don't and you stay in that place, you will become one very miserable person. And, and I'm going to say something here in just the end. You're going to represent that group that said they stayed salty. The marsh, the muck. You'll be that. The second thing the Lord showed me in this is there will never be a revival in the culture if there isn't a revival in the church. We want God to bring revival in the earth. But let me tell you where it starts. It all starts in the church. And who's the church? Parkway Life. no. That's, that's who we are when we're together. I'm not talking about the collective church as far as who we are on Sundays. I'm talking about the real church, who we are on Monday through Saturday. And this is why the enemy is working so hard to keep the saints wore out and deceived and discouraged. Because we're not in a place where we can hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. He said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. But he also says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's not just a revelation that you're going to stand before God and see him in the, in the heavens. This is blessed are the pure in heart, so you can see God. You can see the work of God. You can recognize God in every season and everything that's going on in your life. 
And so He's calling us as a people of God in this time to get back to a place that we forsake this sin-driven hunger that we have in our own way. And we, Because the, the church culture, listen, it is so broken. We've become addicted to a different kind of sin, a different kind of pleasure. We are just as self-absorbent as the evil and the wicked and the blasphemers are. And we are feeding this addiction like somebody that's a feeding an addiction that's coming straight from hell. How many of you want to see God do it again? You know what shocks me? I've been around a long time. And I've been around Pentecost a long time. And this just occurred to me when I was sitting down, finishing, putting the final touch on this message. We are probably... One or two next generations away from a collective generation never experiencing the presence of God manifested in the supernatural way. From, I'm saying a living generation, because there's multiple generations that live at one time. You get that. So I think that we're probably one to two of the next generations to come. For that new generation and the oldest generation, we are probably one or two generations from that collective generation group of generations, never experienced, at least in America, a true, authentic move of the presence of God that changes everything, like we're talking about here in Ezekiel 47. That concerns me. That concerns me. And the third thing that I see the Lord is speaking to me about this is this. When the world has lost its way and the church has lost its influence, then the only solution is for God to send us a revival in a river. The only way this is going to happen is God has to God has to change us and we need to we need to go find the river of God again and we need to keep ourselves in that place where God can transform us. I want to I want to share something fascinating that for those of you who like unique uh, history. There's a little town in Mississippi called Rodney, Mississippi. Let's put it on the screen here. Let me show you this. This is Rodney, Mississippi. Um, Back in the early, well, actually in the late 1700s, Great Britain and France came and occupied a lot of this territory. And then in the latter part, I think around 1793, Spain came and took over this portion of what is considered, you know, the United States, but this particular territory at Rodney. And um, one of the local settlers was able to purchase that land from Spain. I think it was in 19 or 1793. And... There was a, from Delaware, there was a high-powered judge that moved down into this region during that time. And the two of them became very close friends, and they had vision for this specific land. And so the original person who purchased this, original settler, decided to change the name of that town to Rodney. And that's why it's called Rodney, because the judge's name was Rodney. So he changed the name to Rodney. Um... Take it off the screen for just a second. Take, take that, just go to a black screen if you don't mind. Uh, I appreciate that. We'll go back to that in just a second. Because I'm afraid if I say this, you're going to reference to the map. And I'm going to let you do that in a minute. This specific region, the reason why Rodney became an ideal place for these two men to have this vision for this specific place is because... Back in the early 1800s, after they purchased it, they found out that it was one of the best ports for all the trade going up and down the Mississippi River. It was one of the highest. It had the best contour of land, its location from where it was located from, from Mississippi to St. Louis, from I'm sorry, New Orleans to St. Louis. It was in a perfect position for a lot of the trade that was taking place there. And so that particular port, and it became a great city because of the fact that it had tremendous port access. 
It grew astounding. People were moving in by the words coming in. And they were building churches and schools and colleges and commerce that was there. It was just three votes away when it became a part of the Union of the, of the United States. That actually, that city actually became three votes away becoming the capital of Mississippi. Imagine that when you know what happened to it. So this was a, this was a thriving, thriving city. In fact, it was projected to be one of the richest, most prosperous cities in America because of its port access because of what it brought in its location and because of the vision that it had right there all because at that point and it still is today a big part of the the transfer of wealth and the transfer of product and commerce right there through Mississippi at the Mississippi River but somewhere probably I think they said it was around 1850 a sandbar formed and it created a diversion of the actual original flow of the Mississippi, or I say original as far as they could track it back. And it caused the waters to move away from that city, Rodney. And today, that specific city is actually three miles away from where the banks of the Mississippi is. Go back to the second slide, if you would, please, the, the other one of the, that I had up there. You can actually see where the water originally came through. You can see the, 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 the contour. That's where the, the water used to flow. And it, it began to move away from there. And so because the city lost the river, it lost its life. It's a ghost town. There are hardly any inhabitants in that town right now. There are three historic churches that are still there as landmarkers. There is a bridge that goes up there. I think it's called the Death Bridge. All of the roads now are decayed. They're gone. It's not a city anymore. It's totally, completely lost. All because they lost the river. Let me tell you about the flow of the Holy Spirit. He is the life of the church. Yes, it, is. it is not our location. It is not our buildings that we build. It is not our popularity. It is not our personalities. We are alive in existence because of the, because of the river, which is the Holy Spirit, the source. And when we lose the river, we lose our life. When the river is gone, when the water's no more, then we lose our waters. Now, I, I want to just go back and remind you of something that, that is very concerning to me. Notice he said in these verses, go to Nicole, just, just ride with me on this because I'm going to a different place even than probably what I mentioned. It's probably going to be the very last slide of the verses. I'm going to just, just follow me. Fishermen will stand shoulder to shoulder along the shore from En Gedi all the way down to En El Glim, casting their nets. The sea will teem with fresh with fish of all kinds like the fish of the great Mediterranean. But the swamps and the marshes won't become fresh. They will stay salty. I don't know what would happen to Ezekiel when he read that, but I know what happened to me when I read it years ago. I thought, why is that in there? Who is this that we're talking about? He's talking about a place that the water won't go there because it's stagnant. Let me tell you who I believe that that represents. And oh God, please help us get this in our spirit and see ourselves in this whole message today. I believe this represents people that at one time lived in, lived in the flow of God. But the water moved on and it found new direction. And they were too satisfied with what they had in their flow. They didn't want to follow the flow anymore. 
They didn't move with God as God moved, as God continued. And we know that God is a moving God. We see that. That's a part of the historical biblical teaching of the Old Testament of the, of the cloud moving and the people moving with God. And we are still existing in that same concept of God leading His church and guiding us. And there are a lot of Pentecostals that have been baptized in the river of God and can talk about what it used to be and how wonderful it was and how much life there was. And now all it is, there's still water there. But it's stagnant. Who wants to drink that? You can't plant anything in that. How many was here in 2017 when Hurricane Irma came through? Well, those of us that live out in the estates, we live up against a canal. Our property was flooded for about eight days. And I discovered what's called swamp rot. Worst smell you could ever imagine. That's something about swamp rot. The people that are just living in the swamps, they can't smell it. But nobody else wants to get around it because it's, it's, it's muck, it's dead, no life. You can tell us all you want to about how great there was flows of God and how much God moved in that place and all the things that he did. You could talk about the trees that are still there. They're not bearing fruit, but boy, they, had, they bore fruit one time. So since they bore fruit then, then they still, they still count. It's still a special place. And... They're not allowing God to pick them up and say, I've got greater places I'm going to take you and greater things I'm going to do. Listen, it can happen to you a lot easier than you think. Because notice in this, this comparison here, it's not the unexperienced that doesn't get the life. It's the overexperienced that don't get it. It's not the people who have never tasted God and are just living evil and just wicked and, and stuck in the Dead Sea. No, it's the people who once had the flow of God, but they've just become content to say, this is the flow of God and he ain't going nowhere else because we're putting him in the swamp with us. And God is saying, no, I, I've, got, I've got greater things. When I see Isaiah or Ezekiel, being led by this angel that's taken him and he's measuring 1,700 feet and he's taking him farther and farther and farther. I think it's a signif it signifies that God is moving somewhere. And notice this, because I think this speaks of time. Notice this, what we talked about the altar there, how it starts as a trickle and yet it does the supernatural thing that it gets wider and deeper and more water even though the source is small. I think what that tells us is that over time, it's just going to become more all-consuming, which ought to build the church. If, it was, if the flow was going the other way and there was less water, I guess I understand why people would be saying, Lord, just get us out of here. But I believe it is a revelation to us that there's a greater river of God yet to come on the the earth and in the church yes. stand with me and I'm going to close with this reality the origination of this water was the altar this flow started at the altar of the tabernacle the east entrance of the threshold in the Old Testament the altar symbolizes two things Hear this. It symbolizes sacrifice and repentance. The Old Testament altars, anytime you see the practice of worship at altars, it always represented these two things. Sacrifice and repentance. Not one or the other, but both sacrifice and our repentance. Paul said in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this word, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. When we bring sacrifice to the Lord, then we are positioning ourselves as the people of God where God can create a flow of his river. And then when we bring our sins and transgressions before the Lord, well, I ain't got no sins, then you need to spend a little bit more time at the altar because you'll probably find out you probably got something you didn't know about. You just, you just, you walked by real quick and just threw something on the altar. You need to stay at the altar and let the Lord reveal to you probably and to me some of the sins that we don't even see because we're too busy 
fruit inspecting everybody else's lives that we can't even see what's in our own life. When he talks about in Matthew, the gospel, when he talks about those that are walking around and telling people, you got a toothpick in your eye, you got a speck in your eye, and you're walking around with a telephone pole in yours. That's the church today. We are so judgmental. Somebody's got to judge them because if we don't judge them, they're going to think it's acceptable. That's the Holy Spirit's job. We just catch the fish. He cleans them. Here's what I want us to do. I want us, everyone, as we close, I want everyone to come and join me at the front here for a few moments. We're going to do a couple things here. If you don't mind, if you're just comfortable stepping out, we're going to close in prayer together here. Brother Jerome, will you bring my water up there for me, sir? Thank you. <laughs> oh, Holy Spirit, you're speaking to me so much. I, I don't know if I can handle it all right now. I don't think I've ever heard the Holy Spirit say this, but I heard it. I've never heard the Holy Spirit say crusty spirit. But I just heard it a moment ago. I don't even know if there is a such thing as a crusty spirit. But when he said it, I kind of got an idea of what it is. It looks like this. That's a crusty spirit. Let me listen to the test. Are you consumed with pointing out the bad and everything that's going on in your life, in the world, in the church? Do you see the bad and everything, the weather? Yeah, it's going to rain this afternoon. It's supposed to be a 70% chance of rain. All it does is rain around here anymore. It's so hot. So many people moving out here to Florida. I got I to gotta get in line. All these neighbors, these loud cars, these trucks that are rolling coal, blowing smoke out. You know what I'm talking about, guys. It's just, I'm talking about in the everything, everyday thing. I'm just talking about church. I'm talking about just, you have a crusty spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to get you out of that swamp, to lift you out of that mire and that clay and plant your feet in a new place. Let's, let's believe the Holy Spirit today to, to bring us into a better expectation of what's to come. But let's first offer ourselves to Him and let's ask the Lord to find whatever it is in us that needs to be taken out of us that represents sin, disobedience, compromise, whatever it is that the Lord is not pleased with us. The Holy Spirit would do that because I believe strongly God wants to create new life And new rivers out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. We're the church. He wants us to be the tabernacle. He wants us to be the source. He wants us to create the stream and the currents and the direction of where this goes in the earth. Oh, Father, we, we are so humbled in the fact that of any day, in any time, of humanity, you could have caused us to be birthed. You brought us in this day and age for such a time as this. There is no doubt in my mind that we are in the time, Lord, that speaks to the prophecies of the end. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will, in this moment right now, you will as we stand here today and we give ourselves and we offer ourselves to you a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto you which is our reasonable service you would accept us as we are you're not looking for the best in us you're not looking for the good in us you're looking for the all of us you want our all and so Lord we we make an act of surrender to you today God and we ask you Lord as we bring our offerings and, and, and offer ourselves to you that God you will remove of us Lord the things that hinder us that put filters in us that we do not understand and we cannot see and we don't recognize where your spirit is and what you are saying and what you are doing cleanse us as David cried in Psalms uh, 119 when he said Lord Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Purge me with hyssop, God, so that I shall be whiter than snow. 
God, would you cleanse us? Would you deliver us from us and deliver us from the enemy? And would you give us that ability to capture your presence again? Will you come over us, God? And will you visit your church? And will you pour your spirit out in my home, in my life, in Parkway Life Church, in the city of Naples, in America, around the world, oh God? Will you pour your spirit out, oh God? And will you cause the waters to be stirred again, Lord? If I'm stuck in tradition, if I become bound, God, in the traditions of men, while I am thinking that it's acceptable to you, then God, would you pick me up and would you deliver me? And would you give me a taste of where you are so that way I would know you were in it and it is good? And I would desire that place. In the name of Jesus. Take a cruddy spirit out of me, Lord. Restore to me, God. The power of your presence in my life, oh God. The power of your Holy Spirit in me once more, God. Listen, there are some of you, you you represent that generation that has seen the outpouring of God. And you quit talking about it because you just assume nobody wants to know about it anymore. Nobody wants to hear. Nobody cares. It's important for you to continue to stir up the fire and stir up the the hunger and the desire for God to do something. And get the message out that there is still yet another move of God waiting to come. And I want to say this. I believe God's hand is over His church and especially over Parkway Life Church. I believe he's over us. I don't understand some things that's been going on around the city, around this nation, even around this congregation. I don't understand it, but I can tell you I've got a peace that has not left me, and I am confident that we are so close to what God has called us to do. We cannot become weary in well-doing. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I praise you for it. I bless you. 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 Use me, God. Would you use me, Lord? Would you use me, Lord Jesus? Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Church, I'm going to tell you something that you need to be praying about. There's, We are close to announcing a... Just keep playing here if you don't mind. We are very close to announcing a called conference for this congregation concerning this this building. And and you need to pray. And I've not given you a lot of details. I've given you just enough to keep you out of confusion, but just enough to give you some wonder as to what's going on. We have been for the longest in a back and forth conversation, both with the county and the Dave Lawrence Center regarding our property and what's about to be built over here, the $25 million dollar hospital the receiving center for the Dave Lawrence Center and we have been back and forth on the potential and the possibilities so when you something these elders have been praying we are your staff have been praying we've fasted we've been waiting for God to give us direction and we felt the Lord gave us a plan and gave us something to present and it went back and forth we made the presentation last week they accepted the presentation and it will be a miracle for this church Now, not a miracle that it happened. They've already accepted it. Now we're just ironing out the details as it relates to if we do close the deal and sell this, that we get to stay here at least two years. And now the next part of this is, and I wrestle with this, Lord, where are we going to go? What's going to happen? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? And and Dana's had to remind me, you, you need to quit being a real estate agent and just start being the man of God just stay on your knees and pray because I get discouraged every day multiple times I've been shopping the market and I'm like oh my goodness what is going on with the market and so we need you to help us pray that number one we take the right step and how this is going to happen in probably a week or two well I have to I'm, by our church bylaws I'm, I'm responsible to give you a 10 day notice of a called conference we will come together, and the members of this church will have the opportunity, and the elders and staff, we will share with you a presentation of our recommendation for the future of this church, and then we as a church have to vote on that decision before we even make that decision. And Dave Lawrence already knows this. Even though we've agreed to a number, we still have some other small details as it relates to us staying in this building for potentially two years, but we need God in this, and we need our hearts to be unified in all of this, okay? 
and we need and we need God to do a miracle about the land. If somebody's got about 10 acres of land that you want to give to us, or you got a couple extra million you just want to give to us, we'll take the land or the millions. What's up? He's going to do it. I know he is. I know he is. He's already got it. Uh, he's got this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be an exciting thing. Let's pray. We're going to get you out of here. Don't forget, honor God with your tithe and offerings as you go. And uh, bless you. I'm going to tell you what. Uh, Bishop Eugene, come, come on up here. I'm going to have you close in prayer. Can somebody give my singers, give me a mic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to honor this man. There we go. You can greet our, you can greet our people too. You don't Good have to, to see just... you. Because he's got a great accent. I want you to hear that too. 